This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course about schemes, and in it we will be discussing a sort of generalization of the construction of projective space, where we um, do this construction simultaneously over every point of a variety. So first of all, let's recall the construction of a projective variety from a graded algebra, S, which is sum over n greater than root from naught of um, an algebra Sn, sorry, a module Sn. So um, we, we remember we constructed a scheme called proj of S, projective scheme of S or something, and as an underlying set, it consists of prime ideals um, not containing um, the sum for n greater than zero of Sn. And the topology was given as follows. First of all, a base was given by the open sets of the form Df, which was the set of prime ideals such that F is not in the prime ideal. You can think of this as being the points where F doesn't vanish slightly informally. And we defined a sheaf on each of these open sets by saying um, the sheaf on the open set D of F, um, you get by taking the ring S, you can then invert the element F, and then you take the degree zero elements of this. So we gave several examples of this showing that if S was a graded algebra, then this was so if this was a graded algebra over a field S naught, then this was um, often a projective variety over, over the field K. Um, so in particular, we get a map from proj of S to um, the scheme spec of S zero. Um, you also remember that this space comes with a line bundle O of one. So roughly speaking, for every graded module over this graded algebra, we get a line bundle and this, so we, we, we get a sheaf. And for the special case where we take the algebra itself and just shift the grading to get a new module, we, we get a special line bundle O1. Now the idea is to generalize this. Um, instead of working over over um, a ring S0 or um, equivalent an affine scheme spec of S0, what we want to do is to work over any scheme um, X. So the idea is roughly, um, let, let's describe it an informal version what we do is we pick a graded algebra um, for each point of X. And then this goes from each graded algebra, we might be able to get some sort of projective variety for each point. And we kind of join these together somehow um, to get a map from some space Y to X, such that the fibers are maybe projective varieties or schemes or something. Um, so that's a sort of informal way of doing it, which um, doesn't really make too much sense if you look at it too closely. So let's be a bit more precise. What do we mean by picking a graded algebra for each point of X? Well, a better way of describing that is we pick a sheaf of graded algebras over X. What this means is that the sheaf is going to be S which is going to be sum over n greater than root to zero of Si. And the sheaf is going to be an, an algebra, so we've got a map from S tensor S to S 
giving it a commutative multiplication, and this preserves the grading and so on. Um, and so the stalk of this sheaf at every point will be roughly a graded algebra over the local ring at that point. So this is, a, the, you can think of this as being something like um, a graded algebra for each point of X. Well, um, it should have various nice properties. So S should have the following properties. First of all, it should be quasi-coherent. Um, if it isn't, it's a real mess. So this just says it sort of looks locally like a module over a ring. So this is the really important property. There are some other sort of optional extra properties we can have which make life a bit easier but aren't really absolutely vital. First of all, we could assume that S0 is the sheaf of regular functions on X. So this is... If we we're working over a field, this would be like saying S0 is the field K. Um, thirdly, we can assume that SI is, qua is not quasi-coherent, coherent for I greater than or equal to zero. So this would be kind of saying it's sort of like, like a, a bit like a finite dimensional vector space over a field in some sense. Um, and fourthly, we could say that S1 locally generates S. So this is, for, for a graded algebra, this would be the equivalent of saying that the degree one elements generate the whole, um, whole space. In practice, these conditions are often satisfied and make things easier, but they're not really vital. Um, so now what we do is we define a scheme, proj S as follows. What we do is we pick an open affine u in x. Um, and then if we restrict s to u, it becomes essentially a sheaf of graded algebras over the um, over, over the ring of U, so let's say U is the spectrum of some ring A, so it becomes a graded algebra over A. And from this, we can form um, uh, the, the, the projective scheme of this graded algebra. Let's call this algebra something. Let's call it SA. So what's happening is X is covered by these open affine sets. And on each of these open affine sets, we're defining um, a, a sort of projective scheme mapping to the sets. And then we just glue these together. Okay, gluing them together takes a page or two of calculations, just checking that they're compatible on these intersections and so on. But um, I'm simply going to omit it because it's, it's fairly straightforward and not very interesting. Moreover, each of these um, um, has an invertible sheaf O of 1 that we constructed before. And we can also glue together these invertible sheaves O of 1, and we get an invertible sheaf over proj of S. So what we get is we get a map from proj of S to x and proj of s has an invertible sheaf denoted by o of one. So um, it's kind of like the constructing a projective variety from a graded algebra over a field, except that we're doing it simultaneously for all points of a scheme x. Um, and there are several applications of this. So let's list some special cases that we will discuss in more detail. First of all, we can just construct projective varieties. Um, secondly, we can um, construct projective bundles.
over um, scheme X. And um, thirdly, we can blow up a subscheme or equivalently a sheaf of ideals on X. Um, fourthly, we can make ideals locally principal, which I will explain later. Um, fifthly, we can resolve singularities. And sixthly, we can um, make rational maps defined everywhere. Um, now, um, actually, these two are really both variations of the same idea. And all these four things are really variations of blowing up a subscheme. So blowing up a subscheme can make ideas locally principal, it can resolve singularities, and it can make rational maps well defined everywhere. So this lecture, I'm going to just discuss examples one and two. And next lecture, we'll be just giving examples of the remaining four applications of this. So um, example one is really kind of trivial. All we're doing is we're taking X to be the spectrum of a field, and we're taking S to be a graded algebra over K. And then a, you can think of a graded algebra over K as being a graded sheaf of ideals over the spectrum of K if you want. And then the construction we've given for um, taking proj of the sheaf of ideals S is really the same as the construction we gave earlier for constructing a projective variety from X. So, so application one, we've sort of already done. Slightly more interesting variation of this is taking projective bundles over um, a scheme X. And we do this as follows. Let's take S1 to be some locally free sheaf. So this looks locally like O of um, U to the N for U, an open affine subset of X. Um, and then we can put S to be the symmetric algebra of S1 over S0. So for vector spaces, we can define the symmetric algebra, which is um, just the sum of the nth symmetric power of S1. And you can do exactly the same thing for sheaves just by doing it locally. So um, this gives us a symmetric algebra. And we can then form proj of this symmetric algebra, sum over S to the n S1. And locally, this looks just like constructing projective space over open sets U. So locally, this just maps um, some projective space um, over U to some um, open set U. But globally, it might be a sort of twisted version of this. So uh, the, the, the point is the projective spaces at different points can't necessarily be identified with each other. Um, so we can... Uh, Probably easiest to see uh, the simplest example of this, see what's going on. Let's just take X to be one dimensional projective space. So S1 is going to be some um, locally free sheaf. Well, we classified the locally free sheaves over P1. This is Grothendieck's theorem or maybe Birkhoff's theorem. And they're all sums of line bundles O of n i. And let's just take the dimension of S1 to be 2. So we're going to take O of m plus O of n. And we're going to form the sheaf that is the sum of the symmetric powers of O of m plus O of n. 
And we're going to take proj of s and see what it looks like. Um, so what we're getting um, is over each point, we uh, this will look like roughly like a two-dimensional vector space. So the corresponding projective space will just be a one-dimensional projective space. So we get a map from proj of s to p1, and the fibers are just copies of p1. So it's a, it's a we say it's a p1 bundle over p1. Obviously, it could be p1 times p1 mapping to p1, but it can also be be some other things as well. So these things are called Hertzbruck surfaces. Um, Hertzbruck studied them in his first ever paper published in the early 1950s. Um, and first of all, let's see how many we get. So um, obviously, if we start with OM plus ON, this is going to give us the same as if we did ON plus ON. So we can just switch M and N without making any difference. But also, if, if, we, get this, if we take the surface of O M plus K plus O N plus K. This is isomorphic to the surface from O, we get from O N plus O N. And the point is that this thing here is just O M plus O N twisted by a line bundle. Now, if you've got a vector space V and we tensor it with um, some one-dimensional vector space L, um, then um, there's a canonical identification from the projective space of V to the projective space of V tensor with L. I mean, these are obviously isomorphic projective spaces because they're the same dimension. But the point is this isomorphism here is canonical and doesn't depend on choosing a basis for L or whatever. And because it's canonical, this means if we've got a um, if we've got a, um, a locally free sheaf S1 and a locally free sheaf S1 tense at L, where this is an invertible sheaf, then the projective space bundle we get from S1 is isomorphic to the projective space bundle we get from S1 times L, um, because since all these isomorphisms over open sets are canonical, um, that they're compatible whenever you take intersections of open sets. So, so the projective space bundles of these two um, are actually isomorphic. So the, so the Hertzbruck surface of this two-dimensional bundle is isomorphic to the Hertzbruck surface of this two-dimensional bundle because you're just twisting by a line bundle. Um, incidentally, there is one difference between the Hertzbruck surfaces you get from these um, because the construction gives us not only a surface but also a line bundle over the surface. And we do in fact get different line bundles over the Hertzbruck surface from, from these two different line bundles over P1. Um, so let's look at a few Hertzbruck surfaces and see what they look like. So every Hertzbruck surface is isomorphic to a Hertzbruck surface sigma n, which comes from taking the line bundle O naught plus O n for some integer n greater than or equal to zero. Because if we're allowed to switch these and add a constant to them, we can make one, one of the entries zero and the other entries some non-negative integer. So sigma naught is easy. This is just P1 times P1. Because what we're doing is taking the trivial line bundle O of zero plus O of zero over P1, looking at the corresponding projective bundle. And obviously we're just getting something canonically isomorphic to P1 because the fiber 
of this at each point is just canonically a two-dimensional space. So, so sigma naught is just a copy of P1 times P1. Sigma 1 turns out to be a little bit more complicated. It's actually isomorphic to P2 blown up at a point. Um, and this is a little bit confusing to see. It's, it's not difficult, but it's confusing. So let me try and get it right. So first of all, we take the copy of P1. So you can think of this as having coordinates x colon y. And now we, we're looking at the line bundle O of 0 plus O of 1. Um, and let's think about what this line bundle looks like. Well, this line bundle means we're assigning a one dimension, a two-dimensional vector space for each point of P1. And we want to take an element of this two-dimensional vector space for each point of P1. So how do we do this? Well, um, O of zero is easy because that just means we take a complex number. On the other hand, if we want to take an element of the one-dimensional vector space corresponding to P1, it doesn't mean we take a complex number. It means we take an element of the line corresponding to P1. So really we have to take points B and C such that XC equals YB. Um, so um, look, if, if, if we take a non-zero element of, of this, what we're really doing is taking a point of form A colon B colon C with, again, XC equals YB. So in other words, the elements of the projective bundle over P1 corresponding to this can be thought of as follows. They consist of pairs XY a colon B colon C, such that YB equals X um, C. So we're taking a subset of P1 times P2, satisfying this condition here. And this is just equal to the blow up of P2 at the point um, 1, 0, 0. So sigma 1 is isomorphic to P2 blown up at a point. Um, so Hitzebrook showed um, that, um, in fact, all the surfaces sigma n for n greater than or equal to naught are distinct and not isomorphic to each other. Um, however, sigma n is homeomorphic to sigma m if and only if m is congruent to n mod 2. So the surfaces sigma naught and sigma 2 give examples of two surfaces that are birational and homeomorphic, but not actually isomorphic as algebraic surfaces. OK, next lecture, we'll give some examples of um, using this construction to blow up ideals and some of the things you can do with that.